Good morning. Good morning. The rules will be relaxed at this time, and you may uh, use your cameras to take pictures until we start court. If you have a cell phone, uh, please turn them off. Uh, on behalf of your Supreme Court, uh, we want to say thank you to the Jefferson County Bar Association for inviting uh, the court to hold oral, oral argument uh, today here in Pine Bluff. The court enjoyed the reception uh, last night and the dinner that was hosted by the Jeff Jefferson County Bar Association. The court wants to express our appreciation to Judge Tommy Brown, Judge Ernest Brown, and the members of the Jefferson County Bar Association for all their hard work in, in making this happen. The court wants to say thank you uh, to our clerk, Les Steen, our Chief of Security, Eddie Davis, the UAPB Police Chief Maxie Thomas, the Pine Bluff Police Department Chief Brenda Davis Jones, Jefferson County Sheriff's Office Gerald Robinson, and all of the local law enforcement for their help in allowing the court to have their or have the oral argument here today here in, in Pine Bluff. Also, thank you, uh, Carolyn Bond, for working and coordinating events and the publicity. And of course, the court wants to express our appreciation to President Lawrence Davis and the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff for providing this beautiful venue at the Hathaway Howard Fine Arts Center in which to hold this oral argument. Without the attorneys, uh, Doug Norwood of Rogers, Arkansas, and Paul and Gary, the Office of the Revenue Le the Legal Service in Little Rock, agreeing to argue this case in Pine Bluff, we could not have held the oral argument here. So the court wants to say thank you, both of you, for your willingness to argue uh, the case in Pine Bluff. You know, prior to the year 2000, the Supreme Court could not conduct court outside of Little Rock. Uh, and with the passage of Amendment 80 to the Arkansas, Con to Arkansas Constitution in 2000, which was the judicial article, the court can now conduct court outside of Little Rock. Since the passage of Amendment 80, uh, this court has held oral arguments in Fayetteville, Bentonville, Fort Smith, Hope, Monticello, Blyville, Texarkana, Helena, Harrison, Jonesboro, and now Pine Bluff. The court believes that it is very important uh, to hold court in all parts of the state. It gives the people of Arkansas an opportunity to see their Supreme Court at work. You know, not everyone uh, can go to Little Rock and observe their Supreme Court. Uh, this is a very valuable educational tool that gives more people the opportunity to better understand how their Supreme Court works and the role of the Supreme Court as the co-equal third branch of government. Just recently, uh, the court began streaming live the, the Supreme Court's oral arguments. Now everyone, anywhere with internet access can watch the court's oral arguments. The oral arguments are archived and you can watch the oral arguments at any time. At this time I'd like to introduce the justices uh, that serve you on this on your Supreme Court. On my right is Justice Don Corbin. He's a native of Louisville. Uh, Justice Corbin practiced law in Louisville and stamps, served as a city attorney, served 10 years as a state representative, was elected to the first elected Court of Appeals where he served for 10 years and served as the chief judge of that court. And as one of our senior justice um, members, he is beginning his 22nd year as a justice on your Supreme Court. Next is Justice Jim Gunner. Uh, he's from Hope, Arkansas. Justice Gunner practiced law in Hope served as the prosecuting attorney in that district, served as a circuit judge for 22 years, and is beginning his eighth year as a justice on, the, on your Supreme Court. Justice Karen Baker is from Clinton. Uh, justice Baker practiced law in Clinton, served as a public defender, served as a circuit judge for Faulkner, Searcy, and Van Buren County, counties for uh, six years, served as a judge on the Court of Appeals for 10 years, and is beginning her second year as the justice on your Supreme Court. Now on my left, Justice Robert Brown He's from, Rock, from Little Rock, Arkansas. Justice Brown practiced law in Little Rock. He served as a deputy prosecuting attorney in Pulaski County, served as an aide to Governor Bumpers, and then as an aide to Senator Dale Bumpers, uh, served as an aide to Congressman Jim Guy Tucker, 
And as one of our senior justices, he's beginning his 22nd year as a justice on your Supreme Court. Next, Justice Paul Danielson is from Boonville, Arkansas. Justice Danielson uh, clerked for the Supreme Court, practiced law in Fort Smith and Boonville, served as a deputy prosecuting attorney, served as a circuit judge for 12 years for Scott, Logan, Hill, and Conway counties. Justice Danielson is beginning his sixth year as a justice on your Supreme Court. Next, Justice Courtney Goodson of Fayetteville, Arkansas. She grew up in Harrison, Arkansas. Justice Goodson practiced law in Fayetteville, served as a law clerk for the Court of Appeals, served for two years at, on, the, on the Court of Appeals, and is beginning her second year as a justice on your Supreme Court. Now, I'm Jim Hanna. And I grew up in Harrison. I live in Searcy. Practiced law in Searcy, served as a city attorney, deputy prosecuting attorney, city judge, and I served 22 years as a chancery judge for White and Prairie Counties. I'm beginning my 12th year on your Supreme Court and my eighth year as the Chief Justice. Now, after we conclude oral argument, the court will conference the case that will be argued today, and there are four other cases that, uh, that have been submitted which we will conference today. The court will hand down a written opinion within two weeks of the cases being submitted in 75% of the cases. Uh, that's the fastest turnaround in the country, a fact that we're very proud of. After we finish uh, the conference, we will uh, be visiting the local schools today to speak with the students, and we want to thank the uh, members of the Jefferson County Bar Association that will be accompanying us to the schools. Again, thank you uh, for inviting us uh, to come to Pine Bluff and for your hospitality. Mr. Bailiff, uh, the rules are now in effect as we are now starting toward. 11, 1130, Cancun Cyber Cafe and Business Center, Inc. versus City of North Little Rock, Arkansas, Larry Jegley, Pulaski County Prosecuting Attorney in his official capacity, and Danny Bradley, North Little Rock Chief of Police in his official capacity from Pulaski Circuit, 2nd Division, affirmed. CR 11606, Sartain v. State of Arkansas, Pulaski Circuit, 4th Division, affirmed. 11-902, Kenny Staggs and Sheila Staggs, husband and wife and others, versus Union Pacific Railroad Company and others from Independent Circuit, affirmed. 11992 Central Oklahoma Pipeline versus Hawk Field Services and others from Conway Circuit affirmed. Will the clerk please read the submissions? We have one oral argument this morning, 11879 Michael Leonard Miller versus Arkansas Department of Finance and Administration, Richard Weiss, Director from Washington Circuit. All other submissions may be noted in the press. Thank you. Are there any motions by attorneys or parties present? The oral argument today is uh, 11879, Michael Leonard Miller versus Richard Weiss, Director of the Arkansas Department of Finance and uh, Administration. It's an appeal from the Washington County Circuit Court. At this time, the court would recognize counsel for appellate. Good morning, Your Honor. <clears throat> if it please the court, Opposing counsel, my name is Doug Norwood. I represent Michael Miller, who is the appellant. Uh, the first thing I'd like to clarify is there is a mistake in my brief on the number of days that were suspended. Uh, the appellee's brief is correct. The day should be 38, not 52. So, Mr. All right, Mr. Norwood, before you go any further, can you tell me how much time you oh, want I'm to sorry, reserve for Judge, rebuttal? I'd already told the clerk five minutes in very the rebuttal. Very good, very good. You may proceed. I'm sorry. Could you raise that up just a little bit? I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. Okay. Your mic, when you raise it up. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. What we are trying to do is get the court, this court to strike down the administrative license suspension system for DWIs. The purpose of it, the uh, suspension is to get drunk drivers off of the road quickly, even before their criminal case is heard. And so the Arkansas legislature has come up with a statute, and it gives uh, the Department of Finance and Administration the authority to hold hearings. And these hearings are where a police officer submits a, a report saying, I have come to the conclusion that the person is DWI, and then the person can, to a limited extent, to try to rebut that. 
that is the core problem with this case is that the statute as drafted is not a good statute. The statute limits uh, the hearing officer's ability to sub uh, uh, allow subpoenas to be issued on behalf of the driver. And so therefore, he cannot bring in exculpatory evidence. He's allowed to submit his own statement. He is allowed to submit documents, but he's not allowed to subpoena live witnesses who could be exculpatory. And I don't mean exculpatory under the Federal Sixth Amendment, because this is not a criminal case. This is a civil proceeding. So what happens is, in this particular case, Mr. Miller went to the hearing. He complained that there was other evidence that he wanted, other people he wanted to come to this hearing, and it was denied. Whenever we finally got the case in circuit court, uh, it was, we, we called the hearing officer to testify, and she told us the procedure that she used. The procedure that she used was that she took the officer's sworn statement and she considered that to be the most important piece of evidence and directly told me that there was nothing that the appellate Mr. Miller could have done to bring in evidence that would counter that. Her testimony is in the, in the abstract, and it was, to be quite frank with you, quite shocking to me that that's the way they did it. After the... Well, Mr. Norwood, uh, didn't, uh, didn't the uh, circuit court find that, uh, in fact, the hearing officer considered the documents that were brought in by Mr. Miller? Yes, she did. And, but what she did is the lady testified that I will not consider anything that contradicts the officer's statement. So you could have a document. He, could, he brought in a document. She could look at it and go, I consider this and I consider it to be zero value. And I think that's what she did. I think that it was very clear that this administrative hearing officer was acting outside the normal scope of her employment. And in fact, uh, opposing counsel was very good in rehabilitating the way the department did it, called many witnesses in subsequent hearings to show she's not doing it correctly. And so, yes, the, the answer is the circuit judge did find that she did consider other things. But the core problem is th this is more than about Michael Miller. This case is about everybody in every hearing. And so what happens is... But you only is, really got a ruling on the statute as applied to Mr. Miller, so aren't we limited to the application of the statute to Mr. Miller? as opposed to your contention in your brief that it's facially invalid, valid also. You didn't get a ruling on that second point, did you? Yeah, in fact, I did. Um, it's kind of like this. If you have a guy that goes and he, say he's charged with speeding in district court, and the judge finds him guilty, says you're guilty of speeding, and the penalty is we're going to take you out back, we're going to shoot you in the head. And I stand up and I say, well, Judge, that's clearly against federal law. You can't do that. That's a violation of the Eighth Amendment. And if the judge says nothing but just says the bailiff, I've already told you, take him out back, shoot him in the head. That's an implied overruling. And this is where it's at in the transcript. It is on page 23 on the abstract on page 23. And I don't normally quote things out of my paper, but I'm, I need to here. I'm, I'm talking to the judge at this point. I said, we want the court to rule whether the statute is constitutional or unconstitutional for all the reasons I just stated under the 14th Amendment. And at that point, then I guess, depending on what way you, you say or what you rule, then we may or may, may not have a hearing after that. But I don't think that we should have a final hearing. I think the statute's unconstitutional and should be struck down, period. That is a... I condition that on, I don't want you to have a hearing because I think the hearing is illegal. Then she proceeds but, but with the hearing. But did you get a ruling? Assume you did raise the, the facial unconstitutionality of the statute. Did you get a ruling from the trial court on that? Yes, because whenever I say, I want you to rule on this, I can't physically make a circuit judge do anything, Your Honor, as you well know. Right. I, 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 thought, his order, I thought his order specified as applied. Right. Well, I had, I, I had just given, before that little, what I had just said, I had given a whole laundry list, the entire laundry list of things why I thought this was illegal. And then I said, and you can't go and do the administrative, I mean, a de novo hearing. And she said, well, we're going to do the de novo hearing. So to me, that was an implied overruling of that. Did the court continue the matter for additional evidence past that date? 
Yes, the matter was continued several times because of various things. We was it like May 15th or so when the final order came down? Sir, sir, I'm sorry. What was the date on the final order? The date of the final order was sometime in May, I believe. And the date that you're referring to was one or two hearings earlier, right? Sir, I'm sorry. I, I, I can't hear well. I'm sorry. Let me switch questions. Isn't the procedure that was used by the department in this particular case one that was approved in the Mackey case, the U.S. Supreme Court? No. No. These, in, the, in the past, in the, well, they don't have, in the, in far, going back far, there are several U.S. Supreme Court cases on the procedures that were used. But since that time, they have, uh, other cases have said you have to have the ability, that's the Kansas case we talked about. They've applied those federal cases, the one you're talking about, and said you have to have the ability to cross-examine the officer. You have to have the ability to bring in other, uh, other witnesses. And the procedure we have today doesn't do that. Now, the way that they could cure the procedure is if they had to where you could you get a stay automatically whenever you file a notice of appeal. Then the procedure they're using, even if it's a bad procedure, and even if it's technically flawed, constitutionally flawed, at least your license is not suspended until a circuit judge hears your case, and then you do have the right to have the witnesses called in. Mr. Norwood, did, did Mr. Miller have a restricted or provisional license during the whole time this case was pending? Yes, but what happened is he originally started out with a commercial driver's license. He lost that commercial driver's license. They told him he would have to downgrade to a Class D license, which is what most people have. That's just a regular car, you know, driver's license. And then they restricted it, and he could only go back and forth to work. And I think that there was some testimony he could go back uh, to, uh, you know, the alcohol classes and stuff like that. But his license as a commercial driver were taken away from him totally. He lost that completely. So, yes, he did get a limited driver's <coughs> license, but he didn't get the driver's license that he started out with. He couldn't drive a semi-tractor trailer or any kind of a large commercial truck anymore. The Arkansas legislature can fix this. They can either do one of two things. They can give the, uh, have a statute that says you can have limited cross-examination and you could call witnesses and provide exculpatory evidence at the first hearing. Or they could say, we're going to give you the ability to have an automatic stay. Now, Arkansas currently has a stay in place to where the circuit judge can give you one. And in this case, after 30-something days, that actually happened. But the problem is we have that period of time to where the person's been deprived of their driver's license. But what happens if you get a circuit judge that, for whatever reason, says, I don't want to give you a stay? Well, as we know, this is a civil case. Criminal cases in Arkansas take precedent over civil cases. What happens if the judge that you are assigned to has a capital murder case and he can't hear that case? And it goes on for months. And you happen to be a truck driver, you've lost that driver's license, and now you're unemployed. So there are real serious, real-world ramifications to losing your license sometimes even for a short period of time. The let me go back to your first point about due process, not getting due process and not being able to call witnesses and, and subpoena documents and that sort of thing. Uh, why wasn't that cured by the de novo hearing in circuit court after the administrative hearing? Because it would have been had he had been able to get a stay of his driver's license over that 30-something period day. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been complaining about that. Well, he ultimately got a stay, did he not? He did get a stay, but he didn't get a stay for over 30 days after his license was totally, you know, taken away, the commercial license. So the other case, the Kemp case from Kansas illustrates, you know, that why you can't do that, because it's just like back when Judge Watt was taking people's, having people's cars impounded if they had violations, and it went to the Eighth Circuit. The Eighth Circuit says, you have to have some kind of a hearing to do that, and they said that seven days was too much. In this case, ours is over 30 days. So this case, like I said, this case is beyond Mr. Miller. On the facial challenge, I believe that under no cir set of circumstances er, is anybody ever going to get a fair hearing on this because they can't produce witnesses. If the state wants to keep the system they have, I think they have to have a law that says the hearing is, I mean, the uh, 
there is a stay put in place immediately upon filing a notice of appeal. The odd thing about this case is if the judge issues a stay, he has to have a hearing in 120 days. If he doesn't, there is no limit. A person can have their license, and as you well know, because of the way the court system is, emergencies come up, he may be way down the line and get in front of a circuit judge, and his license and livelihood is literally gone away. And by the time he has that hearing and then wins, he, he's lost. I mean, he's, he's bankrupt, his truck's been you know, sold probably, so there's real problems with that. Well, he asked for a hearing within 20 days, as I recall, Mr. Miller did, of the uh, seizure of his license. He asked for a hearing before yes. the administrative hearing officer, okay. and he got that, and that's the hearing you're contending was defective. And then he appealed that uh, to circuit court, and he got the de novo review, and there was a stay granted at that point. Not immediately. Not immediately, but there was a stay. Right, and then, eventually. And then the circuit court uh, heard it with all of the ramifications of a full-blown trial, witnesses, subpoenas, and that sort of thing. Yes. So you're really contesting that the failure to grant a stay more immediately. Well, if they had a grant to stay, I wouldn't be here. Because I think the stay is, the, is, the, is what makes the whole thing constitutionally suspect. Now, let's get back to the issue of the hearing he actually had, the as-applied one. I can't believe that anybody would think that what he got in that hearing with Maureen Strobel was fair. He wanted well, she did. She did look at his medical records, as I understand it. He brought some medical reports about the uh, medication that he was on, and then there was some report on a urine examination, as I recall. Yes. So she did look outside of the police officer's uh, sworn statement. Yes, but that wasn't enough. He wanted to have the officer there. He wanted to question the officer. That is one of the problems is, in that Kimberly case in Kansas, you have to have the officer there to cross-examine him. You have to be able to bring in exculpatory witnesses. Under the statute now, you cannot bring in a witness, subpoenaed witness or non-witness. Mr. Miller's wife was a nurse. He is a severe diabetic. He didn't have the ability to bring her into that here. But you, again, you can do that in circuit court on appeal. Oh, sure. No, I didn't have any problem with the way the circuit court actually did the hearing. We had a full-blown knockdown, drag-out trial that lasted many hearings. We brought, I mean, we threw in everything but the kitchen sink. But the problem is, there was a period of time in there that he didn't have that driver's license. And I think that is the federal constitutional violation under the Due Process Clause. And I don't see any way to remedy that under current statutory authority because there is just no ability to put on a defense case. Now, the stay thing is, is the linchpin of this whole thing. If there was a stay, I wouldn't be here. If there wasn't a stay, and that's why I'm complaining. Because this stay, just in this case, may have been 30-something days. The next case may be six months, and by that time, so a person has no way of proving that, yeah, that's not me. That, I mean, there's a lot of things. I didn't do it. Mr. Norwood, you're now in your rebuttal time. You may oh, reserve, I'm sorry. You may Your reserve Honor. that for you, or you may okay, continue well, to answer the questions. Right, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> this time, the court would recognize the counsel for Appley. May it please the court. Justices, good morning. Good morning to opposing counsel. And uh, I'd also like to extend my thanks to the uh, court and also to our host for hosting us here in Pine Bluff this morning. Uh, Your Honor, if I understand the um, appellant's argument is that... Just a second. Before you get started, can you identify yourself for the record? I'm sorry. Paul Guerin with the Office of Revenue Legal Counsel. Very good. You may proceed. Thank you, Justice Hannah. Uh, if I understand the appellant's argument correctly, if a automatic stay were to be granted via the filing of a petition for de novo review in the circuit court, um, as is the case in Kansas in the, in the Kemke case, all the due process alleged violations at the administrative hearing would be automatically cured. In this case, and also under the statute, 565-402, 
the trial court has the power to grant the stay upon the filing of the complaint. But what the legislature did in 565-402 is to put that decision within the discretion of the circuit court. Now, Mr. Miller's case demonstrates this is a DWI first offense, drug-related, where prescription medication was involved. But his case is not unique. There are DWIs that involve persons that are an extreme danger to the general public. There are repeat DWI offenders that have multiple prior alcohol-related convictions. There are also individuals that get stopped and arrested for DWI where their BAC level is in the .2 and .3 levels. Those are persons that where the legislature, I believe, wisely vested the decision in the circuit court whether to grant a stay or not, to let that person back on the road immediately. Would the circuit judge have been influenced by the administrative hearing officer, Ms. Strobel, I think her name is, which admittedly some of the pronouncements she made at that hearing were erroneous about what she could consider and could not consider. Would he have been influenced, I'm talking about the circuit judge, by this erroneous decision by the administrative officer in not granting the stay? I think that's one of the questions that Mr. Norwood is raising. Well, Your Honor, it's been my practice with the department that typically for first offender DWIs in Arkansas, they are granted the stays quite often by the circuit courts. Now, but if the circuit court in this case had not granted a stay, the circuit court set the first hearing in this case, the final hearing on the petition for Danilo review in March, March 15th, I believe. So had the stay not been in place, he still would have got a full due process adversarial hearing before the circuit court in March. The suspension went into effect in January. Mackey v. Montrem, the U.S. Supreme Court case, demonstrates that under the due process clause, a post-deprivation hearing is okay. And I believe it was Massachusetts and Mackey that it was Massachusetts was the state that was taking action. If a person refused a chemical test in Mackey, their driving privileges were summarily suspended. In Arkansas, we have a 30-day period. So the Supreme Court in Mackey demonstrates that a post-deprivation hearing is fine as long as it's held as promptly as possible. And here the suspension went into effect in January. The full final hearing was to be scheduled in March. Counselor? Yes, Your Honor. You referred to Kempke earlier. And I was wondering, do you think that the Kansas Supreme Court found it significant that their statutory scheme included a provision for an automatic stay? Here it's discretionary, but in Kansas it was automatic. I think that the court in Kempke did, in fact. And in Kempke, they departed from their prior case law in Kansas. In Kempke, there was a case called Wolfkill and also Carson that they held in those cases that the licensee had a right to subpoena the arresting law enforcement officer, but not other relevant witnesses, to the administrative hearing. Kempke overruled Wolfkill and Carson on that point. And I think in part was the fact that there was the provision for the automatic stay upon the filing of the petition for de novo review. But what is important in Kempke, which I did find surprising, is that at the administrative hearing and at the de novo review proceedings in their version of the circuit court, the licensee bears the burden of proof. In Arkansas, the department bears the burden of proof. So I find that in Arkansas the protections are greater than what the Kempke court permitted was permissible under the due process clause. But I did want to return to a very important point that is the failure of the appellant to obtain a ruling on the facial challenge. Certainly, I'll concede that the argument was made in their initial filing of their motion and also in the court on all of these facial challenges to the statute. But the court only spoke to an as-applied challenge in its ruling from the bench and also from the final written order 
that was filed in June of last year. Um, and as the court has recognized, even constitutional issues, um, if the litigant does not obtain a ruling from the circuit court, that will prevent um, appellate review of that argument. I don't, they're, they're, um, I think the trial court was fairly clear that, um, and in the context of what the judge spoke to in terms of the actual, uh, what the hearing officer did in Mr. Miller's specific case, what Ms. Strobel did, that she was only, the judge was only speaking to Mr. Miller's as applied challenge. Well, Mr. Uh, Norwood also made an argument about the administrative um, proceeding being a sham. Do you agree that a ruling was obtained on that? I think that the judge um, stated that Mr. Miller was granted and, and given a, a hearing that comported with due process. So I think that she, um, Judge Taylor certainly ruled as applied to Mr. Miller if uh, upon Mr. Norwood's argument that it was a sham hearing, she only spoke, the judge only spoke to the as applied challenge that Mr. Miller advanced. Mr. Uh, Miller's argument is that the, uh, the statute in order to pass the due process requirements of the 14th Amendment would require the, the uh, ability to subpoena the all, all relevant witnesses, not just the arresting law enforcement officer, but anybody. Um, would also require an automatic stay um, would require that um, the hearing be held within 120 days, if I understand correctly, whether there's a stay uh, granted or not. The judge did not talk about any of those specific issues. The judge made this very limited ruling and then asked the department to proceed with the petition for de novo review, and that was during the May hearing. Uh, so I don't think under the existing Arkansas Supreme Court precedent uh, such as Jackson versus State, uh, Gwen versus Daniels, that we had um, a ruling on the facial challenge at all for this court to actually review. Now, in turning to the um, as applied challenge, the department certainly conceded in their brief that Ms. Strobel misunderstood some of the aspects of her training. And as the department presented, um, we called the assistant administrator of driver services, Anita Boatman, um, the uh, Appellant in rebuttal to Ms. Boatman's testimony called Ms. Boatman as well as two hearing officers um, that were employed with the department. Uh, there was ample evidence in the record that demonstrates that DFA tries very hard to provide a, an adequate due process hearing, allows licensees all the time that they need to gather additional evidence if necessary. And Ms. Nor Mr. Norbert in his uh, argument stated that Mr. Miller couldn't uh, bring his wife, who was a, a registered nurse, and might be able to provide some um, medical expertise to the hearing officer to the hearing. That's, that's just not true. The statute does not prevent the licensee from bringing a fact witness, uh, a, a, an expert witness, to the administrative hearing. There's nothing that prevents that within the, the four corners of the statute. Um, the only what the statute does prevent is the department just does not have the power to issue a subpoena for the appearance of a witness or for um, the department to issue a subpoena, uh, deuces tecum, to compel the production of documents to be considered at the administrative hearing. Mr. And certainly, Jerry, let, let, let me go back to the stay issue because, you know, after this administrative hearing, they filed the petition, Miller filed the petition in circuit court, and that was like January 14th. Uh, did he request a stay at that time? We've talked about the automatic stay. Did he immediately request a stay when he filed the petition? Uh, he immediately requested a stay, Your Honor. And, and then um, you say it's a matter of discretion with the trial court. And, and what happened, Your Honor, um, in this particular case, um, and this is not going to be in the record to be considered, but it's just from my own uh, recollection, is that um, well, an it's attorney... it's hard for us to consider something that's not in the record. Certainly. But it's... Uh, uh, in order to have a um, hearing on the issue of the stay was entered, I'm not sure of the specific date, but the hearing was set for February the 8th of 2011, and that is in the record. Uh, the trial court bumped that hearing till later in February, not at the request of the appellee in this case, or at the request of the appellant to my knowledge, and it may have been because Northwest Arkansas had a terrible snowstorm during that period of time. 
But is Mr. Norwood, in effect, arguing an abuse of discretion by not granting an automatic stay as of the date of the filing of the petition? I'm not, sir. If that's if that's Mr. Norwood's argument, I couldn't speak to him. Uh, but I, I don't think that um, Mr. Norwood, in this case, has made any argument that the judge abused her discretion by changing the date of the stay hearing from February the 8th until February the 25th. Um, all the parties were unsure how the order got entered, but, but I, I certainly don't know. Uh, but certainly, it had the um, hearing been held, in fact, on February the 8th, we're talking about a time frame of a matter of just a, a few short weeks that uh, an order could have been entered um, to stay the suspension. Now, what's, what's important, uh, Your Honor, is that Another thing is that we, we stressed in our brief is that the appellant had every ability to go to the circuit court much faster to get the, um, an order setting a hearing or to get the judge to grant a stay. The, the inaction by the appellant does not render the statute unconstitutional. The rights to get the stay are within the four corners of the statute. So. Um, had Mr. Miller more promptly pursued that right to obtain either the judge to grant a uh, ex parte order staying the suspension or, at a, or alternatively to get an order setting an actual hearing, that responsibility was on the appellant. And any, any delay between the imposition of the suspend, administrative suspension and the granting of the stay um, is, uh, of course, the responsibility of the appellant to go to the circuit court and um, obtain whatever remedy they can to get their driver's license back. Uh, Your Honors, if there aren't any more questions, I, that will uh, uh, conclude my oral argument. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Court would recognize counsel for appellate Thank to conclude his argument. Uh, Justice Brown, I did not argue that there was an uh, abuse of discretion in the judge uh, delaying this day. I didn't, I didn't argue that at the, at the trial level. <clears throat> That's really issue, your uh, contending. I mean, you're contending the fact that there was no stay entered and the judge did not enter the stay. Why didn't you mount that, that argument? Well, it was just the fact that the stay itself, for whatever reason, wasn't automatic, was the legal challenge. Uh, the thing about the facial challenge, if I understand that the facial challenge is that a person is saying, under no set of circumstances is this law good. When the circuit judge said, I find that there is no violation of the as applied, then that automatically took it past the no set of circumstances. It, it would be just, well, what else would she say? I mean, she could say, yes, and I also find that it's not a violation of as applied. Well, she just said that because if it, she doesn't find it on the facts, then it, it just, the logic of it just goes, well, th there's no reason for her to say anything else. You know, in every case, no matter if it's the brief, it's the, uh, the oral arguments, you want to leave the judges with one thing, maybe more than others. This is it for me. You can have a police officer who arrests someone for DWI, and he got out of the police academy a week ago. And he, for whatever reason, thinks that the driver is DWI drugs. And he takes the guy down to the police department, and he gets a 25-year veteran of the Arkansas State Police, a DRE expert, who comes in and examines him. And the guy from the state police goes, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this guy. He is absolutely sober. Whenever that report goes to the initial driving driver's license hearing, the person that works for the department looks at it and goes, this officer's of the opinion that this person is DWI drugs. I cannot make that state trooper who did the DRE and has 25 years of experience come and refute what that officer says. That's fairness. I, I just, I missed it in law school somewhere or another. I must have been late for class that day. That is not even remotely fair. That does not provide for a meaningful hearing when there is absolute 
exculpatory evidence that literally would let the guy walk. Not just that there would be a conflict, but I have a videotape of the defendant maybe, who, or he may have been in jail. I could get the jailer to come say, that guy was in cell 17C at the time that trooper says that he was out there on the side of the road. It ain't this guy. I can't do that. That's just simply not fair, and that's why this statute is unconstitutional. And I want you to hold it to be unconstitutional, facially and as a part of Mr. Miller. Thank you. Just a second. Are there any questions? Thank you very thank, much. Thank you very much. That does conclude the oral argument today. Uh, once again, uh, special thanks to Mr. Norwood, Mr. Gary, and Green to, to have the oral argument here in Pine Bluff to make this possible. And again, the court extends our uh, great appreciation and, and thanks for being invited uh, to be here, your hospitality, and uh, we certainly hope and trust this has been informative for everybody that's been here. Uh, Mr. Bailiff, I'm going to ask you if you would, uh, recess court until, uh, adjourn court until next Thursday at 9 a.m. in Little Rock. Everyone rise.